Find out what's on TJC. Sign up for our bi-weekly email program guide at TJCTV.com. Welcome to the Salon. Coming up, the debate over pregnancy reduction, lessons learned from the Lady Klutsky tragedy, can a submissive wife be president, our magazine covers getting too sexy, and resolutions for the Jewish New Year. It's coming up on The Salon. Hello, I'm Jane Eisner, editor of The Forward and Forward.com. And I'm Rachel Sklar, editor-at-large of Mediate.com. And we both welcome you to The Salon. So Rachel, it's the end of the summer. How was your vacation? Windy. Windy. <laughs> How was yours? <laughs> we did have some weather incidents here. We did. We did. That's true. Well, I had a wonderful summer. My oldest daughter got married, and then my husband and I went on a long-awaited trip to the Galapagos Islands, wow. where we hung out with gigantic tortoises and swam with penguins, and it was pretty cool. Uh, well, I can't really compete with that, but I, I did do something sort of cool. Um, I went back to my old summer camp, Camp Winnebago, uh, for a special alumni musical review performance where we all got to re-strut our glory upon the stage. And um, yes, it was like grown-up glee. Uh -huh. So that was fun. Good for you. Yeah, that well, I'm wonderful. not like, it's something. I don't know, but good for me. <laughs> it was fun. <laughs> well, we have some very interesting women joining us today. Um, Caroline Waxler is a writer and digital strategist and a comedian. Deborah Colvin is the editor of the Jewish parenting website kfeller.com. And Marcy Natan is the new national president of Hadassah, the Women's Zionist Organization of America. So Debbie, I thought we'd start um, talking about something that's certainly been in the news a lot, and that is parenting. Too much, too little. On the one hand, we had this tragic story of the little boy in Brooklyn, Libby Kletsky, who was essentially kidnapped and murdered um, on the first day that his parents actually let him walk home from camp by himself. On the other hand, we have these stories of, of women who are sort of um, purposefully sending their kids out. Um, our columnist, uh, Lenore Skenazy, you know, famously sent her nine-year-old on the New York subway by himself and got pilloried for it. Um, but she stands by that. Now, you're in this parenting world, uh, both as a parent yourself and uh, in terms of the wonderful website that you run. And I was just wondering, what are you hearing about this debate? I mean, I think the unfortunate thing that um there was this horrible incident with Libby Kletsky, but that the takeaway was that the talk was about overparenting. And really, this had nothing to do with overparenting. This was a freak, horrible thing that happened to one, one boy. But the conversation shouldn't mean that we should now all keep our children inside close to us and never let them have any space. Should they take the subway by themselves when they're eight? No, probably not. But I think that there needs to be something, something in the middle. Um, but I think it'd be really unfortunate if the takeaway from this was that was that we need to keep our children even closer and overparent them even more. Well, certainly, um, as um, the mother of now, you know, women in their twenties, I I still feel this worry about when my daughters go off to some strange country in the Middle East or Africa, as they're prone to do, and <laughs> um, and yet I also know that I can't stop them from doing it, and I, it's just that worry about when is the right time to let go and when isn't, and that we can't control everything. We can't control every you know my child's too, so she's not going off to Africa yet, but she's going off other places, right? And and you can't control every single thing that they do, and I don't think it's good for either of you if if you do. Marzi, do you think that this conversation has changed a lot in the last few decades? Oh, has it, gotten it has more complicated? changed enormously. In what way? Um, well, um, my children are now in their 40s, so we're going back a few years. And the, uh, and the classic thing to do was take your kid, put him in a carriage, out in the fresh air where Yes, you could look out a window and see when that carriage started to rock, but I think you would have been considered an unfit mother if you kept the, the child in or, or perpetually under guard all the time. And I look today at my granddaughter, and it's sad that she won't, you know, she is watched so much more carefully 
and uh, truthfully, to some extent, I think, out of necessity. Well, actually, kids are watched a lot more, but is, is, are there more crimes nowadays? I feel like there probably were, it was probably more dangerous decades ago. Now there's all these different ways to keep up with your child, whether you can call the child, you can Skype. I mean, there's better ways to communicate. Your children are overseas. Either you can communicate, you can have an idea rather than having them just send a telegram or whatever it was, you know, call from if they could get a phone once a month. So I think actually p kids are way overprotected now. And I'm not sure, I don't know the statistics, whether it is more dangerous out, but I think we're doing our kids a disservice by watching them too closely. And they really need to go out and embrace the world and, you know, hope. I guess you just have to hope for the best. Obviously, you shouldn't have uh, an eight-year-old, seven-year-old on the subway, but, you know, there's there are differences. Walking a few blocks, in theory, should be okay. You know, I mean, the parents went over yeah. the route with him. Yep. I mean, I'm, when I just think back of myself, and granted, I didn't grow up in New York City. I grew up in, you know, yeah. suburban Toronto. But walk to school every day. Like I'm like having these flashbacks of me like playing in the woods in a ravine. Like, okay, <laughs> that is probably not a good idea. But this, what what the kids did. We had a park nearby, and you know, you'd you'd walk around. And the watching now starts when they're born. I mean, people have video monitors. They, yep. everyone has a video monitor watching their kids sleep, and it just. I, I, you know, I think it's I think it's really sad, and I I think it's sad that we can't leave our kids outside to to sleep and watch them in a stroller. You know, my friends in in Berlin, she goes, she gets a cup of coffee, she leaves her baby in the stroller outside, and she comes back, and it's fine. And I don't know if the social contract there is different, mm -hmm. you know, but I do think you know I grew up in New York City, and it's safer now than it was when I grew yep. up. Absolutely. But you know, people there's still so much fear, and it's you know it's. What are we losing? What are and our kids losing? I think losing? we do have this expectation that because we have the technology, we can keep up. I mean, I yeah. notice uh, it's uh, it's so silly. I, I realize it. You know, when my kids are in college in a protected campus, I don't need to hear them hear from them <laughs> so much. But if they're at home and they're out late, I'm I'm all of a sudden I'm worried. And then I think back to my own childhood or young adulthood, where I'd be gone for months and would barely be yep. able to be in touch with my parents. I mean, a phone call was a big deal when you were overseas. Just um, learning how to use the phone was a big <laughs> deal when you were overseas. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> so probably we ought to chill a little bit. Um, yeah. But there's another subject, I think, related to family life that uh, really has been in the news. And that's this whole sort of question, and particularly in the evangelical community, about the submissive wife. And uh, we've certainly heard about this in conjunction with Michelle Bachman, who we're told yep. is one of the front runners for the Republican nomination for president. Uh, Marcy, what do you make of this? I so believe that a woman is every, has every bit as much right to have a full life and that the direction that that life takes needs to come from within her and not direction <laughs> from outside. Now, I am very married, have been for close to 50 years wow. now. Wow, congratulations. And <laughs> I have watched in my, you know, in my own life times where truly my husband played what I would call the lead role. Yep. I mean, we moved because his job changed. Or we made a decision about the, the lifestyle based on primarily his salary. I was home. I raised my children um, in a world where, for the most part, women did not work unless there was an absolute necessity. But we are now at a, at a time in our marriage where my career, if you will, and it may be a volunteer career, but it is absolutely mm -hmm. a career, is what drives the decisions that we're making in the direction that we take. So our roles have changed, and over the years, just in specific situations, one or the other of us took the lead. And, mm -hmm. and the thought that as a woman, one needs to be the submissive one or take direction from anyone else is uh, very difficult. Right. For the me. issue with yeah. Michelle Bachman is that uh, you know she's publicly stated that she is like happily submissive to the will of her husband. That she 
you know, she elected to become a tax lawyer, not because she liked tax law, but because her husband <laughs> distilled the will of the Lord towards her and, and pushed her towards that goal. And I mean, you know, that's not that's not the decision making pathway you <laughs> want, you know, with the finger poised over the red button. As president. Or, or is she just letting her husband think that he's the one running everything? I mean, what does it mean to be like to to be submissive and to be running for president? Like, I don't even understand. Right. I, I mean, the whole thing to me is so absurd. The I think submissive she's, leader of the free world. Yeah. I think she's I think she's brilliant in the way that I don't believe it, she believes any of this. I think she's just telling it to the voters who want to hear that. That's just her shtick. So, so. I, I was, you know, in, in the interest of being a good journalist, really trying to get my brain around this mm -hmm. distinction. Um, you know, how, how can you be the submissive wife and run for the most important office in the entire planet? Um, which, you know, which uh, it seems like the number one job yeah. requirement is a gigantic ego. Um, and so I'm just wondering, could there be a distinction in the way we are as women in the home versus in the public sphere? I mean, is that a fair distinction to make? Could she argue that I'm one way in, you know, Congress, or I'd be in the White House, and another way at home? But is she—is that what she's saying? I don't know. I mean, I—I'm I, I, just trying to figure out how I someone think anybody can, can make that argument. You—you you know, you have different dynamics with anybody that you—you you spend a great deal of time with. Mm -hmm. You have, you know, there are office dynamics, and there yes. are home dynamics, and there are friend dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so of course there, there's going to be a difference. I mean, the Obamas have joked about. You know, Obama leaving, you know, President Obama leaving his stinky socks around and Michelle Obama saying, don't do that. I mean, they're like dom they're domestic shtick, as you yeah. say, it has been put out there, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to, to, to demonstrate that he is part of an egalitarian family unit. Mm -hmm. But uh, there has not been the suggestion that Michelle Obama is dictating policy. She certainly is an influencer of the president, but <laughs> there's certainly, I mean, how ludicrous would it be? Can you? imagine the reaction on the right if Obama, Obama said something like, well, you know, I just want to be submissive to the will of Michelle. So if Michelle <laughs> tells me to do something, I'm cool. Just pause for a moment and imagine that. <laughs> and I think here, the, the and, and I think I might agree, you know, what is she really thinking or what she really believes, but the message that she is putting out there and the, the influence that she has because of her political standing. So the message she's putting out there for the American woman mm -hmm. is almost like the argument that we have with the models of, if you are so anorexic and thin, you know, w what are you telling to our young people today? And so I have a big problem with the message and, and, it's, and it's scary that if she's doing this for votes, that that gets you votes? Oh, it's... I, I mean, that's... I, mean, I think it's all an act. Let's not even talk about think, Rick Perry and what he's doing for votes. I think it's all an act. If she's so submissive, she would not be running for president. Another topic that we wanted to raise today was uh, a study by, I, I guess, uh, the, by examining Rolling Stone covers mm -hmm. over uh, the past, how many years? 40, 40 years? Uh, that women have, I mean, big shock, women are depicted as, as sexual beings, but not so much as being sexy as being available for sex. And the, sort of the question being, you know, what are the messages when Katy Perry is, you know, naked, just so on, on a cloud in Teenage Dream or whatever. I mean, Katy Perry is, is yeah, just one of many, but she just always does seem to be as naked as she can possibly be. <laughs> well, and the study also looked at magazine covers actually over 50 years and said uh, not only are women portrayed in that way much more than men, but the portrayal of women has increased dramatically. So now, like, the majority of the times that women are on the cover of Rolling Stone, it's in this sexualized um, capacity. And, you know, what is this doing to us and to the images that we want to um, put out there to the public? My feelings on that are that I think that with internet and TV and movies and all the increasing outlets to find sexual images of women, they just have to keep upping the ante. I think for the time the women covers 50 years ago were very sexual, very pushing the envelope, but I think now with all the opportunities to see sexy images, naked covers, these magazines need to sell issues. So they want they know that in order to get newsstand sales, the co the images have to be sexier. And that's what the audience is demanding. I mean, they wouldn't be doing this if sales weren't 
happening because of the covers. I guess, you know, as someone uh, who still clings uh, to yeah. print journalism to some degree, I, I actually do wonder, though, if it is a winning formula. I mean, Have you, you know, tried, like, you know, the sexy version of the forward? Yeah, I'm just saying. <laughs> we do. We we try to put um, uh, pictures, as we call them, p uh, gratuitous photos of Israeli models in uh, as many issues as we can. It has to be there on page three. That's, That's the right. <laughs> the forward um, after dark. I mean, I, I feel like we're supposed to be horrified by this, right? We're all, you know, don't think that women should have to be naked on the cover yep. of magazines. But what is, if you also look at what's happened to women in the past period of time, what is it, 43, 50 years? I feel like we've made tremendous progress. So what are what are we supposed to take away from this? So women have maybe like less clothes on on the cover of Rolling Stone. Should we be horrified? I mean, what's I I don't know if anybody saw the uh, documentary about Gloria Steinem on HBO, where but she she does she talks about this uh, about you know uh, it's not for us to Im impose our vision of what women should or should not reveal how they should comport themselves. The question is, is this being done from a position of empowerment or a position of oppression? If it's being done from a position of, of empowerment, if it is a choice on the part of the woman to express herself this way, then great, go for it. That is part of the progress that she fought for. If it is a, a function of oppression, not so much. And I think so that's, that is the balance. And I, I do think that there's a continuum, you know. It's it's if if the standard to which one ought to aspire, you know, where, where young girls see a standard they want to aspire to, like, are they being oppressed into thinking that that's the way they want to express themselves? I don't know. Well, actually, I agree with you, and Rachel. You bring up a good point. It reminds me recently of Project One Runway. Project Runway recently had a campaign where Heidi Klum, who is the star, she's the producer did advertising where she was completely naked. Now this is a show about empowerment and coming up finding new designers, but she, in order to sell the show, she herself chose to be naked. And it's a show with an audience that's primarily about women. So I don't know what message that sends, but it just shows me that you have to push the envelope in increasing, increasingly many more ways. I don't know, call me a prude. I just find that really offensive. You know, if you're gonna be partly naked to um, advertise a new bra, yeah. then yeah, I get that. Yep. But I guess what I find offensive is not the cover of Rolling Stone, um, which has always been sort of edgy yeah. and out there and countercultural. What I find offensive is the way it seems that, you know, to market, I don't know, dishwashing detergent. You have to be. But this, um, but this is marketing it. fashion, and fashion's always pushing right. the envelope, right? And it could be empowering. It could be saying, like, look, what, like, it doesn't have to be shameful. Take off your clothes. Right. I'm not saying that that was the intention. Was, this was very sexy. Now, and older than she was when she was a sexy young model. Now she's like, she's, she's a mom. Awesome. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, but, but this, I think, was on Lifetime. Isn't Project Runway is carried by Lifetime, which is a women's only network, and this was the advertising. It just really made me think, and I actually was thinking of how it's pushing the envelope well, now. Also, I and just have a question, sorry. which is, how do you um, promote clothing if you're naked? <laughs> I, I think she had a ribbon. <laughs> oh, she had a ribbon. ribbon. Of course. The other piece of this is, again, coming back to what is the message that we're giving to the younger, our, our, our kids or our grandkids mm -hmm. growing up in this environment, and you look at the way they're dressing today, yep. and I, I, I have this memory of my mother um, being with me when the kids were coming home from school one day and, and looking at them and turning to me and saying, I don't know how these boys learn anything. <laughs> uh, you know, this is uh, junior high, high or high school <laughs> age and, and the girls with the, those short, tight yeah. uh, but, shorts. You know, but then it's the really deceptive tops. parents because, I mean, at least for a while, you do have control over what your children are wearing. I mean, when you are buying the clothing. I feel like and I've already lost control and she's only two. So. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think this That's brings hilarious. it back yeah. to what we were talking about before. You know, you exercise good judgment as a parent. Yeah. You try to instill good good values and good lessons and let your kid Yeah, take but I gotta tell you, when my, uh, uh, my other daughters, uh, not the bride, um, were getting fitted for their bridesmaids' uh, dresses um, for the wedding uh, in June, I 
was there at one of the fittings, only one of them, and I'm telling the ta tailor, you lift up that strap a little <laughs> bit more. I don't Mom. want so much showing there. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I felt I, like it all looked very beautiful and classy and tasteful <laughs> and stylish that's in the because, photos. That's because I had them lift up the straps on uh, <laughs> some of those. I still, I was paying for the dress. I could control that one. <laughs> um, but we do see Fair enough. the kids that leave the house looking uh, as, <laughs> as those parents feel it's proper, and then you watch them as they make their way. Yeah, we, we lived across from the schoolyard. <laughs> yeah. As they make, make their way to school, and they're rolling up the this, or they're rolling down the that, and uh, there there is a great deal of peer pressure that uh, well, maybe I think I saw that. Well. I think I saw that made-for-TV movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that, well. that proves that we shouldn't let them walk to school by themselves. <laughs> um, I, I want to bring up a, an, another uh, subject, a um, more serious one about choice. Uh, there was a quite a controversial um, story in the New York Times Magazine a few weeks ago about this whole question of pregnancy reduction of women who have um, become pregnant with multiple births, twins or triplets, and um, elective. Uh, choose to abort one of them. What kind of issues does this raise for us in terms of, you know, even if you um, uh, believe in having reproductive rights, is it, it, should it go that far? I feel like I've read this sort of story in the New York Times seven different times. Uh, they always <laughs> have something on the cover. There's like a woman who's a surrogate or she hired, anyway. But um, I feel like this makes everyone very uncomfortable, right? It somehow, it just it feels kind of icky, like you're doing something wrong. And I think that it's a little bit dangerous. And I think that, look, abortion is also a little, it, it's a really hard topic and it's icky. And it's, and either you believe in it or you don't. And you believe that women are able to make that choice and are capable of making that choice or you don't. And you can look at all these different variations and, and they're really difficult topics and but I feel like it, always, you know, it still comes down to this core of whether or not you personally believe that that's that's her choice to make. And I think also it, with this, it's it's it feels a little bit like you 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 wonder because of IVF, are people being irresponsible with IVF, or if they're being mm. irresponsible if they're not having safe sex, does that somehow make it wrong? And I think that's what also makes people a little uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. I mean, people have been being irresponsible about their reproductive you know, consequences yeah. for a lot longer than IVF has been around. So uh, I, I think that I, I agree with you. It is it does, if you believe in the choice, and and sort of like it, even if you you sort of put parameters around it, like well, like an early stage abortion, you know, you're more comfortable with that. This is that's when this procedure is happening in a hospital, sanctioned by doctors. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah, it, it makes you uncomfortable because it, it does, it feels sort of gratuitous because we have, you know, abortion has been about whether a woman wants to be pregnant, whether a woman is ready to have a child. So once that's taken out of the equation, like, I'm happy to be pregnant, I'm happy to have a child, I just don't want to have this child, then it does create that sort of murky question. But if, if you do distill it down to choice, then I, I think that um, you know you have to stand by that and well, and, and turn it around yeah. a little bit to, to 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 again point out that the spilling of seed you know wantonly <laughs> happens all the time and so you know like what's good for the goose may, must be good for the gander <laughs> or something like that. well I you know I. I, I don't know. Um, I, you know, I'm very squarely in favor of reproductive rights. I think Roe v. Wade is a brilliant construction of, 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 you know, the differing rights of the fetus and the woman as pregnancy progresses. But I, I'm deeply troubled by this, and I, I, I don't think that just because you're pro-choice means that you can opt out of the conversation. I mean, I think, I think these kinds of selective abortions really make it very difficult for those of us who do believe that a woman ought to. Have have the right to choose. Um, I'm so, not sure I would tell yeah. somebody else not to do this. I'm not sure I would outlaw it, but uh, but I do think it is so, uh, important. Well, what, what's for the us. difference for you? Because um, because I think that um, the we're we're essentially saying you know there's twins in the belly, so one is a fetus and one is a child to be, and we're making that decision. We the woman yeah. or whoever or society allowing her to make that decision. Um, not not saying 
I, you know, I want to abort because it's, um, you know, rape or incest. I want to abort because I'm not ready to have a child. I want to uh, abort for all whatever other reasons. But I don't see, what's the difference between saying I'm aborting because I'm not ready to have a child and I'm aborting one of these because I'm, I don't think I can properly take care of two children. I don't think I'm capable of that. Well, then I, I, I just, I just think that we have to recognize that in that um, argument, we're in, in essence treating the fetus in a different way. And um, because we're saying that one deserves to live and one doesn't. What about, how do you all feel about adoption? What about putting one of the children up for adoption? I mean, you could always say that when someone's gonna have an abortion, just put them up for adoption, right? But if you have two twins and you choose to send one out for adoption and keep one, how does the mother make that choice? But how does the mother ever make the choice about aborting versus yeah. versus adoption? It's just, I, I don't, I. I still don't see the difference between having an abortion and choosing to abort one when you have two. Well, um, I, I, I think it's really troubling. And, um, and I think that it's okay to say that, even if you're pro-choice, or at least I think But I that, think abortion yeah. is troubling, right? I think it's really troubling to think about having to do it myself, and it's an extremely personal decision. Yep. And it's troubling, it's not easy. It's a really, but I just don't see how this is any more troubling than aborting one, than than because you're taking, because you're bringing into the equation with abortion, it's I'm not ready to have this child, a child now. Mm -hmm. I mean, and but with, with abortion, this, it's it's it can also be like I don't want to have this child. Like, I mean, people who stand up for reproductive rights also must necessarily stand up for, you know, the the case where someone is just irresponsible and they're like, oh, that sucks, I got, an, I got pregnant, <laughs> I guess I should do something about it because like, clearly I don't want to have a kid. I mean, that's, that's the, the person we least want to protect and enable yes. in such a, a, a troubling and, and deep feeling issue. But in order to protect the, you know, th the people on this side of the scale, you have to make it an absolute thing, an absolute right. And, um, you know, because once you start getting into judging people's motives and how pure they are, you get into the troubling territory that has banned abortions in the first place. So this, I agree with you, I'm also troubled by it, but I, I recognize that, you know, to not be resolute on it is to open the door and like, and this is, strategically, this is terrible for the movement mm -hmm. because it is, it is causing people who were formerly staunch to suddenly waver, and then so that's the, that's the soft underbelly. It's like, aha, you are troubled about killing babies, <laughs> and and so I I do think that you know that's why I'm coming back to what you originally said, which is you just have to look at it from like the pure standpoint of who has the right, and at what point do you have that right? And Otherwise, I think, I think the discussion we're having here has to do with each of us grappling yeah. with you know, a situation that we find really untenable. Yes. But if we are in favor of pro-choice, then I think we need to say each woman in that position is making, whether it is, it is to abort the pregnancy or to abort one fetus in a multiple pregnancy, the ramifications of it and the living with it afterwards is a decision that we hope she has considered at the time and, and I too would say um, as a proponent of the movement and, and as the representative of an organization that is certainly pro-choice that we need to allow this to be a part of that whole process. Yep. So, Marcy, if we can, uh, you have just become the national president of Hadassah. Uh, it is, as you mentioned, a voluntary role, but an extremely important one. Um, we're just about up to Rosh Hashanah in the new year. What New Year's resolutions do you have <laughs> on the part of Hadassah and maybe even for yourself? <laughs> for myself, uh, you know, may I have the strength and, and the wisdom to lead us through these next four years and it is um, an exciting, uh, a heady and a, and a very important responsibility. We are about to go into our centennial year, so I think we are, um, it's, it's 
I, just such, I, I, I still pinch myself when I say I will actually be the national president as we celebrate 100 years since our um, beginning. So that part of it is kind of goes without saying. The, the big challenges that we face, I'm looking at the four of you and I would love to see the face of Hadassah become that this younger, energized, involved, um, she call me younger, really Rachel. committed. Isn't that nice? yeah, you, you, you are, you are. By, by, um, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so that's certainly one of the one of the challenges and and one of the the goals that I would like to strive for is to really be able to engage younger women to find the way through today's new media technology. And the funny thing is, I mean, I remember years ago sitting with small groups where there were like ten women in a, you know in the Dakotas somewhere and trying to connect them to, and the challenge of connecting yeah. them to Hadassah, we've met that challenge. We can connect them, whether it's through Twitter or Facebook or Skype or Breeze sessions where we can bring training to them. And the challenge now is finding our voice, in a, defining our voice in a way that it will be enticing for the young woman when she wakes up at two in the morning and, and says, uh, you know, I'm not sleeping anymore tonight, and, and out comes the iPad or the, <laughs> or, the, uh, or the phone or the computer, and they're looking, and, and I'd like them to, to feel comfortable coming to Hadassah. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, if I you have a sleep expert, then, then they will. <laughs> <laughs> De Debbie, what's your uh, New Year's resolution? Mine is totally selfish and personal, which is that um, I'm going to listen to my mother-in-law, and I think it's about time that my husband and our two-year-old are not living in a one-bedroom apartment anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so my resolution is to move into a bigger apartment. Good for you. <laughs> <laughs> Caroline, how about you? Besides joining Hadassah <laughs> and, and reading the foreword. Yay! Um, I just hope this new year brings exciting things and for my resolution I'm inspired by what you were saying and by what everyone's saying is um, to and also read more, discuss more and also to see my mother more. <laughs> oh, so. good. I think that's a wonderful thing. How about oh, you? Oh god. Um, you know, just just to dress sexier. <laughs> I think that like I, I think I'd like to be empowered and just dress sexier. I want to um, buy a new bicycle and ride it more. That's my New Year's resolution. Can I have a redo? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, well, you've um, joined us for another wonderful episode of The Salon. Thank you so much to our guests, to Carolyn Waxler, to Deborah Colbin, and to Marcy Natan. And of course, to my co-host, Rachel Sklar. And to you, sexy forward, Jane Osner. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, you can continue this conversation at the, on the Sisterhood blog at forward.com. Uh, for Rachel and everyone here at the Jewish Channel, we wish you uh, a joyous, sweet, and healthy and fulfilling new year.